Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you. My head is so big, I'm going to get stuck in the door, so just push me out when we finish. And I am a dentist, please don't hold this against me. Right? Someone asked me a few years ago, what do you do? And every time on the plane I say I'm a dentist, they don't talk to me for the rest of the journey at all. So I came up with, I usually say to people, I transform people's lives by giving them the smile they deserve, the smile they always wanted. Sounds more glamorous than saying that I do root canal all day. <laughs> March 15th, 2019, Friday morning, beautiful Friday morning. The sun is shining in the sky. The air is fresh and crisp that you can almost eat it. Christchurch, beautiful part of the world in New Zealand. People were gathering for the prayers in Al Nur Mosque in Christchurch. Not too far from the mosque, around 20 minutes drive, is the emergency department, the ER, which we say. They just got alerted. Huge casualties were heading their way. Someone just decided to shot at the mosque. There were women, there were kids as little as six months old. Men, they were just gathered there on a beautiful Friday morning for the prayers, for peace. When the emergency department, the ER, I'll call it ER, when the ER got alerted, they were told that approximately more than 50 people wounded, kids, women, men are heading their way. They were also told to stay away from all the windows and the doors as well, because the police suspected that two gunmen are actually heading the ER way behind the ambulance as well. What the ER team did that day in that little hospital created a history. They created an example for the world. As soon as they were told to stay away from the doors and windows and not to go out, not ev even a single person moved. Not even a single team member decided to leave the department because it was too dangerous to stay there. On the contrary, from the back doors, people from social worker department, people from ICU actually flooded into the department. The guns were in the front and every single person came from the back door to actually help the team. When I was talking to, I was doing the interview of the ER team post the incidents, there were a few things that stood out for me. I was talking to this new registrar. He was hardly 25, 26 year old. And he clearly remembered the incidents when he was in the room with the mother and the father. They were sitting on the floor and there was two year old baby and an eight-year-old boy he was treating. He couldn't save the two-year-old. And somehow the mother found out that he couldn't save the two-year-old. They couldn't speak the same language either. They were speaking in Arabic, sitting on the pr ground, prayers. And this New Zealander Caucasian registrar couldn't actually tell him what was happening. So mother assumed that both of her child were gone. And he said, I never felt so helpless as a doctor. I just wanted to convey that one of your kid is actually safe and survived. And he said in that moment, this, this girl came into the department. She was wearing a hijab. And he said, I couldn't exactly remember, but I have seen her in the hospital somewhere. I couldn't even know, s tell her her name. And he said, she dropped down on the floor next to the mother, held her hand, and she, he said she said something in Arabic. And as, as soon as she said something, the mother got up, went to the other bed, and hugged her son. Because she just conveyed that your eight-year-old is alive. He said, I've never felt so helpless. But this, this girl with the hijab came as an angel in that moment. And he clearly remembered the head of the department walking past the room. He said, as he was walking past, he looked at my face. He turned around, came into the room. 
and hugged me and he said his words were i needed that hug as much as you needed that hug the er room the whole team put their head down and powered through the day but every single person in that room actually remembers that girl with the hijab when i sat down with that girl i will call her saj let's call her saj when i sat down with that girl and i asked her she she told me a completely different experience she said i've been working in this in this hospital for 5 years she said i have had multiple experiences how people behaved and how people treated around me she said my hijab was always in front people didn't knew who i was people didn't knew my name people didn't even knew what department i was the only identity but identity i had was the girl with the hijab and she said that day she said i was there were there were incidences where i would just try and hide that so that people wouldn't see my hijab they will see me as a person and she said that day my hijab became my shining star because every single person needed me she said i have not never held so many hands i have never given so many hugs the hugs i gave that day and apart from two people er department that day saved every single person every single person walked out of there alive why am i telling you this story the reason i'm telling you this story is in my research one of the most diverse workplace environment is the hospital and in the hospital one of the most diverse workplace is er when it's a matter of life and death we only see life can anyone tell me what is the first thing we notice about another human being what is the first thing as soon as you see another human being what will be the first thing your mind registers their face anyone else your body anyone else are they like me skin color anyone want to guess how many minutes or seconds it takes for our brain to register 10 a minute how many how many what time less than 4 seconds first thing first thing you will notice about another human being is the skin color and we've been saying for years and years and years that we're all same when we say we're all same do you understand that we our brain is trying to say or the other person that i actually don't notice your skin color it doesn't matter i don't notice that you wear a hijab but to be honest it does matter because that's their identity that's who they are that's what that person is so what do, what are we doing when we say we're all equal we're all same what are we doing we're actually telling the other person that just i don't see you i don't see your color and it's not only just for the people of color or the women or different sexual orientation it's actually becoming for caucasians and whites as well there are many many workplaces i have gone to and i have seen where actually white skin is a minority so it's not only about the people of color it's not only about the women it's not only about the people from different sexual orientations or faith or religion how many times i have heard in my workplace where you say you know you know i'm gay right and then the other person turns around but you're not gay gay right <laughs> what does that even mean so what happens then this is what we do cassandra was talking about the mental health and the mental illness and depression imagine you live a life at workplace just pretending that you're someone else they did a research in silicon valley so most of the people from different origin or different countries they behave completely like caucasians in silicon valley 
hundred percent their food habits the way they talk their slang the way they speak english the way they behave the etiquettes everything like so that they will fit into that environment when they go home they behave like who they are what their origin is do you think it's a good balance of life doesn't that mean that the whole day or that their workplace they're wearing a mask and what is that doing to their mental ability what is that doing to actually their mental health they're having an identity crisis Howard and Google did a research and they say if a person is free they're free to express who they are the creativity goes up the innovation goes up hence there is a 152% more productivity and efficiency yes shown i'm talking about productivity and efficiency <laughs> but that's the research because that's directly related to your expression of who you are you're not hiding you're not fighting an internal battle anymore and that's why profession professionals have a very high suicidal rate we come doctors come in like number 1 and tech comes in the top top 5 when you when you count the suicidal rate so that's why for far too long for far too many years we have been fighting over differences of skin color and we're fighting over differences of male female sexual orientation where artificial intelligence is on the edge it's already here it is already here and if i don't accept another person of a different color if i don't accept a person of different sexual orientation how the hell am i going to accept a machine as a doctor would i the battle ground will change but we're still fighting a battle for the future need we actually do need to accept who we are and who the other person is so that we can actually become kind of augmented humans we need as shawn said we need a future version of us and the future version of us is so that we start accepting the differences so that we can actually utilize the machines for our better future rather than fighting the machines now someone asked me a question they said you know no we're not going to fight we're going to be fine we are a primal animal If you go into the research and you go into the sign our DNA hasn't changed much and as we were talking about the men and the women and the consent yesterday our DNA actually basically hasn't changed much we still male and female we still work at the same level we become civilized but i usually call it not just civilized we have become over civilized for our DNA so we have this battle where our our body or our mind works differently but the world needs a different version of us so what happens as a human our primal nature is still the same we still the same fight or flight One of the biggest example is when when someone asks you to do like public speaking or say go in front of the stage your palms get sweaty you, your throat dries up your voice is shaking that's the adrenaline in the body that's what we used to do and that's what we still do we see someone who is not familiar to us our brain registered that this person is not familiar to us oh, like, oh i don't trust you if you watch kids a little bit the little kids when they go into the child care or who here has been in a bus in a school remember you 6 or 7 year old you go into the bus and you like should i sit here no it doesn't look familiar should i sit here no that that kid doesn't look good should i sit here oh yeah their bag matches to my bag color that's when you go and sit next to that person so whenever we see unfamiliar familiarity that's what happens to us we either fight with that person or we just go like you know i'm not going to i'm not going to talk to her 
she looks different, she seems different. This is who are we, we are naturally. So when our, our world becomes a global, when our world becomes multicultural, it's not our fault. No one actually ever taught us that we're supposed to be actually accepting the differences as well rather than fighting them. We're going against the human nature when we go and we say, all right, I'm actually going to go and talk to an African person or an Indian person. We're going against our nature. So you do need a little bit of a training when you go against the nature. No one actually trained us. So we live as a primal human, live in this over-civilized world where we pretty much don't know what to do. Like with the females, women in the workforce, they were never supposed to work in the workforce. And now we are empowered. So we have spent this whole generation. My parents is like, you know, yeah, you're, you're strong. You can do everything. You can do anything. They forgot to actually train my brother in it. Now you have this group of empowered women, but you have this group of men who don't know what to do with it. And that's where the differences came. That's where we actually start messing up things a little bit. This is literally what we do. So, what do we do in this global world when we have people from all around the world? W how do you actually bring them together? If you, if you notice your pattern on the cruise, which I'm hearing in last few days, the most common conversation and the longest conversation is about food. <laughs> Someone had like 12 meals a day. Like seriously, you're trying every single thing. You might not like it, but you're trying every single thing. So they say first number one thing to bring people together is the food. And that's what you can do at your workplace as well. Bring a plate. Bring a plate. One of the, when I, when I did the research, one of the interesting system I found was in universities. Whenever you have first years, and I had the same as well, we have like a get together where you will have a get together where people from all different parts of the world or cities in US or in India, we come together, we have a party, we drink, we eat, and we gel together. Where are you from? Which country? Which part? Why don't we do it at the workplace? Do we actually ever stand up and announce that, look, we have hired this new person and this new person is from India and this new person is going to tell a little bit about India and themselves? Because that's, that plays a major role in cover-up. It's like, I don't need to be an Indian. I don't need to be an Af uh, African. I just need to be the tech guy who does programming. Why don't we just throw like a welcoming little half an hour get-together? And I did this little test in Australia in some of the emergency departments because they are one of the most diverse departments. And you wouldn't believe the highest, highest number of plates with different cuisine was 42. In one department, 42 different types of food because these people were from 42 different parts of the world. And they said that was the best thing suddenly the dynamics of the department changed. Suddenly they were not hiding who they were. And it changed the whole scenario because they have to, they have to work together. You cannot question like, you know, all right, that person is dying and we're doing a CPR and this doctor, Indian doctor is telling me to do this. Should I listen to him? You don't have a chance there. But that also means that whatever you do fits into that environment, pretty much will fit into any other environment as well. So one of the biggest thing is food. It brings us together. Have you ever sat down on a plane? And I get it all the time. It's like I sit on a plane and it's like, you're from India. I love butter chicken. And I go <laughs> like, I don't like butter chicken. <laughs> we do. We label people as well. We label food with them as well. And that's what I was asking yesterday. I was saying yesterday is permission, a simple, simple thing. I have been in many conversations in US as well. And in terms of diversity and inclusion, we are, we are at a very sensitive terms. 
you're not sure if you're going to ask someone where are you from are you going to offend them because they might be the third generation living in US or Australia so the biggest thing i found is i always whenever i go i ask for permission find your way to ask permission from the person and it could be as simple as that can i say something simple very very simple sentences which used to be the etiquettes we're forgetting them so simple ask for permission if you're not sure at workplace and you're not sure in the environment or the plane or the ship just ask for permission can i ask you a question please i have been asked nearly 50 times says like you know where are you from on this ship where are you from and it depends on my mood what answer i give <laughs> same in us as well they will say where are you from and i will go australia and they go like really <laughs> okay yeah i'm 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 from australia they like no where you are from from i was like i'm originally from india it's like that's where i get this strange accent from you're not talking like an indian you're not talking like an australian either so the biggest thing is ask for permission that will sort out so many issues and so many um concerns in the workplace as well specifically i'll i'll share another story of um covering up this is one of my mentor in australia his name is sam gothon he was in an accident nearly 10 years ago he was declared dead on the scene and when he they took him to the hospital they were able to revive him but he lost one of his arm and leg with three little young kids and doctors told him he will never be able to walk he will never never be able to do the normal humanly things he had choices choice either live his life like that or do something out of it so when he came out he had he didn't have one arm or one leg and they gave him the bionic he was actually the first bionic man in australia what happened after that was surprising usually when we see a person with disability and to be honest we consider that's that's human they say don't judge anyone but we do we do consider them a little bit less we we have this feeling of sympathy around them that they're less somehow we don't accept it but that's the truth psychology human psychology that's how it works people accepted him he made he was like you know they still charge me the equal amount for the shirt though i don't need wear arm <laughs> right but people accepted him the way he was they celebrated him he was different you cannot miss him he walks into a room and he cannot hide so he said i can't pretend that i don't have a arm machine arm hanging out of my body so he said i'm just going to accept who i am but that was the point he accepted himself before anyone else accepted him so doesn't matter doesn't matter which nationality you're from doesn't matter what you have one arm less one leg less hairs brown color different if you will not accept yourself people won't accept you either so he accepted himself then he was accepted by the public as well and he's actually one of the most successful pe- public speaker who has founded an institute multi million dollar institute as well and he spoke in un probably 3 months ago and he's australian of the year as well you could have never imagined 10 years ago that that will be that person he got accepted and then he was celebrated and i think that's what we need to do we need to start accepting people for who they are and when i say your origin is sup- your superpower don't get me wrong i'm not talking about just nationality what you come through like shawn as a caucasian having a computer at home was a normal for him I come from a domestic violence background. I have covered myself for 20 years. When the girls will talk about their dads or going to the park or going to the movies with their dad, I will just cover up and be happy. 
every morning me and my mom will cover up our faces with the makeup. So I have covered up. So I know what covering up means. It doesn't mean that you're a Caucasian, that you're going to be equal to another Caucasian. It doesn't mean that a typical Indian female will be similar to another Indian female. Your upbringing, your background plays a major role. So when I talk about your origin, it means your struggles. Your struggles in life, they made you who you are today. One of the statements I usually say that everyone's life is a movie. More struggles you go through, bigger blockbuster is going to be. But the trick is that you, you have to accept it. You have to embrace it so that you, you can be free. As I said, for 20 years I was covering up. And then one day it was, it was too much and I was on the edge of it. It's like, you know, that's enough. I'm not pretending that, you know, I had a great upbringing. No, but that's what made me who I am today. What you went through, mental health, depression, getting rejected for the jobs, Debbie. Will you ever be at this stage and keep learning if they didn't reject you? You might still be doing some little thing somewhere. So every single failure is a redirection, but you need to accept that that's what made me that who I am, that's what my power is, that's where my power lies. Because your stories, your story of hardship, someone sitting somewhere might be going through the same thing. And yes, I say this, and I'm proudly say this, that they might look at you and say like, you know what, if she can do this, I can do this too. There is no reason why, why the little kids today can't be Steve Jobs, can't be better than Steve Jobs. But if we can teach them one thing, that accept who you are internally. Don't wear a mask, don't wear a cover, do not try to fit in. Because the world is changing and it's changing faster than we can actually imagine. If you're trying to fit in with the humans today, are you going to try to fit in with robots tomorrow and wear like a steel cap and be an Iron Man? <laughs> so that's, the, that's my message with your origin, your superpower, is let's reimagine human connections. Let's reimagine human powers, the values we have, so that we can actually be better equipped for the future, our kids can be better equipped for a fastest changing world and use AI for better so that we can be, and I call it augmented human because it sounds cool for the future, <laughs> literally. But we will become, trust me, if we, rather than similarities, if we start accepting the differences and start celebrating them, we will become augmented human the humans world have never seen before. And minor things of skin color, race, money, social status will probably won't mean anything. Thank you. <laughs>